Uh, we have four presentations today. Um, this um, Zoom session is being uh, recorded. I presume you're all aware of that. Uh, my name is John Cash. Uh, I'm affiliated with the sociology program at the University of Melbourne, where uh, previously I was involved in running the social theory program. Um, we then have presentations, and, and I'll be uh, doing the first presentation. Thereafter, we'll have presentations by Rebecca Olson from University of Queensland, Sam Hand from University of Western Australia, and then Ben Gook from University of Melbourne. Uh, you have all the details in the program, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. Um, we're really pleased to uh, be uh, running this panel with Taza, and um, as I'm doing the first presentation, uh, I'll get started in a moment. Um, if there are questions that you have, um, we're going to suggest that you use the uh, the chat um, facility to simply uh, type in that you'd like to ask a question and maybe give a hint as to what it would be, and then we've uh, allocated uh, 18 minutes for each presentation and then that means roughly 18 minutes at the end for questions and discussion and as we've just established we will go a little bit longer if uh, there's sufficient interest for that okay so uh, as i'm uh, leading off i will uh, get started right now um, <coughs> my presentation is titled norms of sociality and the demise of symbolic efficiency in the now normal. And this presentation focuses on some ways in which psychoanalytic social theory can illuminate what we're calling the now normal. And illuminate how this now normal is situated within some long, longer term social, political and subjective changes that are unfolding in varying ways across the globe spurred by the effects of globalization and the world risk society. In analyzing contemporary world politics from the local to the global, Slavo Zizek refers to the demise of symbolic efficiency, Ulrich Beck to the loss of trust and the excoriating effects of what he terms linear doubt. While Julia Kristeva highlights the risks entailed in human subjects remaining strangers to ourselves. Judith Butler highlights human vulnerability, as of course does Chris Dava. <clears throat> human vulnerability commencing with the helplessness and dependency on others of the human infant. And Butler develops an account of precarious life that is always already deeply embedded in competing norms of recognition. All four recognize how globalization or the World Risk Society have heightened anxiety by destabilizing established ways of being, thinking, feeling and relating. Despite some significant differences, all four converge in recognizing the declining capacity of established cultures and institutions to quell anxiety and implicitly to support defenses against ontological insecurity. Yet at the same time, and this is a principal part of my own argument, ontological insecurity is so destabilizing that it must be defended against with whatever means are either already available or can be created. Anthony Giddens's characterization of ontological security is helpful here when he writes, what's at stake is the maintenance or collapse of time, space, continuity and identity, and the prospect of being overwhelmed by anxieties that reach to the very roots of our coherent sense of being in the world. In one major response to ontological insecurity, itself clearly intensified in the contemporary now normal. In this major response, we see 
a revitalization of populist nationalisms and particularisms. They offered a, a defense against ontological insecurity. But in doing so, they wage war against otherness and difference. Moreover, they often cultivate conspiracy theories that give paranoid form to defenses against ontological insecurity. So instead of cultivating a capacity for creative and contemplative ambivalence, in which our own internal otherness, the unconscious, and our physical vulnerability are recognized as characteristics that are common to all human subjects, populist ideologies encode and propagate psychic processes of splitting and projection. They do so in an attempt to establish as proper what Wendy Brown helpfully identifies as the social imaginary central to the desire for border walls. Namely, as she puts it, wishes for potency, protection, containment, and even innocence. Such populist ideologies construct a split world of friend and enemy. However, their capacity to organize this world is faltering. They too have lost their symbolic efficiency. The complexities generated by globalization and the world risk society defy friend enemy solutions. Instead, they multiply their downsides as the Trump presidency so painfully illustrates. At the same time, this very destabilization opens the possibility for productive and creative change in which new or reinvented modes of being, thinking, feeling, and relating to others are trialed and occasionally socially instituted. For instance, the Black Lives Matter social movement in the United States contains such a transformative potential. The open question concerns the extent to which it can succeed in displacing the othering norms of recognition that are currently in place. Now, with that sufficing as a brief overview of my broader concerns, let me enter the complex territory of our COVID-19 now normal by mentioning that claim par excellence of existential anxiety as fundamental to the human condition, namely Jean-Paul Sartre's phrase, hell is other people. That well-known phrase comes from the last few lines of Sartre's 1944 play, Puy Clo, or No Exit, and it warrants a slightly longer quote. So this is hell. I'd never have believed it. You remember all we were told about the torture chambers, the fire and brimstone, the burning mile, old wives' tales. There's no need for red hot pokers. Hell is other people. This Sartrean recognition that hell is other people highlights both our sociality and our singularity. It emphasizes that the gaze of the other penetrates and disciplines the human subject. And yet the other is necessary for each of us to become and to be a human subject. The irony and tragedy of the current situation where we all find ourselves in the midst of an unevenly distributed viral pandemic is that existential anxiety has mutated into sheer biological vulnerability while reinforcing itself as pervasive anxiety. Now, the, frame, the refrain that hell is other people is at least potentially accurate in both biological and existential senses. So who and what can we trust? Should we enter into total lockdown with no exit, at least for now? Or should we step out into an invisible and subjectively incalculable set of risks and hazards? Existential anxiety and biological vulnerability have collapsed into each other. So what is the now normal? Now, of course, the short answer is that we simply don't know unless it is the regular and also irregular disruption of established routines and mentalities 
and a longing for some simulacrum of that which was. The irony, of course, is that those established routines and mentalities were already facing significant disruption, as Butler, Beck, Christova, Zizek, and of course, many others have recognised. The differentially distributed viral environment that we all now inhabit has simultaneously stalled time while accelerating and intensifying both the loss of symbolic efficiency and the threat of ontological insecurity. Like Freud, Klein, Kristeva, Lacan and Zizek, Judith Butler also places heavy emphasis on the helplessness and dependency of the human infant and the ways in which reliance on the caring or the uncaring other marks itself upon the subject and leaves a trace that drives othering processes. For Butler, norms of recognition located within the discursive field also mark themselves upon human subjects. But empowered by this very subjection, these subjects can turn and claim a capacity for agency that may enable a shift to an alternative norm of recognition, thereby displacing those norms that are, to use my terminology, encoded with othering mechanisms. In the face of so many influences that promote othering processes, the prospect of displacing such harm-inducing mentalities rests on the qualitative variability of the cultural field, as well as on psychic modification via an enhanced acceptance of strangeness within and an enhanced capacity for sublimation. And it's the qualitative variability of the cultural field that creates the possibility to render as proper an alternative common sense. This alternative common sense may be achieved via alternative cultural repertoires that validate norms of recognition encoded with psychic defences that contain rather than split ambivalence and that incorporate rather than dissect complexity. These alternate cultural repertoires are structured by what Melanie Klein characterises as the depressive position. Their redemptive virtue is that they promote respect and care for the other, as well as for the stranger within. Consequently, if and when such defences that contain rather than split ambivalence are encoded into shared norms of recognition, they can support sublimation and creative cooperation. They can displace friend-enemy mentalities. The striking feature of the now normal is the way the several and qualitatively distinct norms and defences confront each other. Ranging from friend-enemy splitting and projection on the one hand, to ambivalence containing rather than ambivalence splitting, creative caring and solidarity on the other. Across this range, these qualitatively distinct norms and defences have each consolidated into particular and discrete, walled off, as it were, alternative constellations. They construct alternative realities, we might say. The degrees of freedom previously available that supported episodic movement across that range of norms and defences, these degrees of freedom have shrunk. Now, while that's evident in Australia, I think it's clearly far more evident in the United States and to a lesser degree in Europe. In the United States, the politicization of masks and the widespread refusal of safe practices, along with the spread of conspiracy theories and the repression or denial of epidemiological knowledge and common sense, all of these highlight how the already deeply embedded popular social imaginary exploited by Trump and others has been intensified, but also I suggest purified as it were, or distilled 
by the enhanced now normal anxiety and concomitant ontological insecurity. However, fortunately, this has not become hegemonic. In the United States, it is resisted by Black Lives Matter. Of course, it's resisted by dedicated hospital workers and beyond that, by multiple communities of concern and mutual support. These all point to alternate norms of recognition and defenses against ontological insecurity that support a capacity to dwell in ambivalence, even in these exceptional times. However, to highlight my argument about the intensified separation and purification, the walling off, as I put it, of each of these qualitatively different normative and defensive constellations, I'll conclude by quoting a disillusioned and clearly in mourning emergency room nurse. Um, her name is Jodie Doring, um, and she was reporting on her experience with many dying patients in South Dakota. So she tweeted, I have a night off from the hospital. I can't help but think of the COVID patients the last few days. The ones that stick out are those who still don't believe the virus is real. The ones who scream at you for a magic medicine and that Joe Biden is going to ruin the USA, all while gasping for breath on 100% vapor therm. They tell you there must be another reason they are sick. They call you names and ask why you have to wear all that stuff because they don't have COVID because it's not real. Yes, that really happens and I can't stop thinking about it. These people really think this isn't going to happen to them. And then they stop yelling at you when they get intubated. It's like a horror movie that never ends. And then interviewed on CNN, she commented further. Their last dying words are, this can't be happening to me, it's not real. And when they should be spending time FaceTiming with their families, they're filled with anger and hatred. I just can't believe those are going to be their last thoughts and words. In Jody Doring's testimony, a pure culture of friend enemy preserves and multiplies itself, even as care and concern is offered and death beckons. However, as I previously suggested, the current moment is double-sided and potentially opens onto an alternative social imaginary. The very authorization and incitement of friend and enemy mentalities and their inevitable destructiveness demands a political and social response that involves displacing the norms and defenses that authorize and organize such a pure culture of friend enemy with its reliance on psychic defenses of splitting and projection. However, in order to be anything more than merely an alternative populism, that political and cultural response must compete to establish a capacity to dwell in ambivalence. In turn, the cultivation of that capacity involves more than the heroic transformation of individual subjectivity, however virtuous that may be. To be socially and politically transacted, such a transformation requires the institution of alternate norms of recognition and defenses against anxiety that contain rather than split ambivalence, that creatively engage with complexity and that support negotiation from a position that regards the other as equally entitled like the self. Such a constellation of norms of recognition would amount to a new or renewed common sense, a qualitatively distinct social imaginary that while precarious may also be transformative. That's a difficult task, a difficult ask, but it is one that we see attempted every day while, of course, resisted every day. Obviously, it's a task worth persevering with. Thank you very much.
Uh, we'll now move on very quickly to Rebecca Olson's presentation. And I'll allow Rebecca to introduce herself. I think she'll do that on the first slide, I would guess. I'll just take a moment to share my screen. Make everything. Switch to all right. Can everybody see the um, not the note screen, but the presentation screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. So my presentation is um, kind of an invitation to weave together and reflect on two works in progress on emotions in the context of COVID-19. So first I'll introduce you to some co-authored work with colleagues McKenzie um, and Potoni and Bauer on a theory of collective emotions, mass emotional events relevant uh, to COVID-19. Then I'll introduce you to some work I've led examining the narratives of healthcare professionals on the COVID front line and how these narratives attend to the tension between trust and uncertainty in medicine that COVID lays bare. Um, and I'll finish with an invitation to kind of consider the implications of these two works together. So at the height of the first wave, of course, Australians were feeling scared of this unknown virus. Um, isolated from everyone else outside of our homes, we were feeling grief for fast roles, identities and forms of connection that had to be postponed indefinitely, things like um, singing in a choir. Uh, but we found new ways of enacting these emotions and relations on online. Twitter challenges were some of the ways we found to feel together and fight you might, of course, be able to do And in a recent paper, um, co-authors and I have called the kind of distinctly wide-reaching emotional phenomena that we saw, and to some extent continue to see with COVID-19, a mass emotional event. So it's distinct from previous research on collective emotions. Um, von Schieve and Ismer break this research down into three categories in their review with face-to-face -face theories of emotional contagion tending to kind of draw heavily on the psychological literature and emphasizing co-presence and mimicry. Cultural theories of collective emotions like emotional landscapes and emotional climate, focusing on how the normative context of a community underpins shared emotions and expected emotional experiences and expressions, and group theories of collective emotions emphasizing self-identification with a group as central to collective emotional experiences. So these theories conceptualize emotional contagion as spreading physically between interacting individuals or through shared cultural representations and identities. Um, but as has become evident uh, with COVID-19, Emotional contagion can also exist in virtual spaces with memes and tweets, sites with a specific emotional intensity that users access and reproduce through virtual exchanges. So overall, these theories are uh, limited to subgroups and subcultures and can't really explain the mass convergence of emotions across societies and nations that we saw and to some extent continue to see with COVID-19. So instead, we argue that the recent pandemic warrants the development of a broadened understanding of emotional contagions and con collective emotions to incorporate what we are calling mass emotional events. So the fundamental differences between mass emotional events and hitherto examples of emotional contagions are first, the mass scale of both the event itself and the resulting collective emotional experience. Second, the emotional contagion in mass emotional events um, that develop and spread from fundamental changes, both in human interaction brought on by the event and by interaction with non-human sources of emotionally charged 
and saturating information, such as mass media, public panic, and uh, public health campaigns. And third, um, the catalyst of the event being something that participants may have no direct contact with, but regardless, it's uh, having a kind of profound impact on their lives. Uh, so with 9-11 and the bushfires providing other examples. So next, I'll shift to examining what COVID as a mass emotional event has meant for medicine, specifically trust in medicine. So medicine's story, its popular story is one we're all familiar with. It's a story of progress. Um, and documentaries like this one that I have depicted in the slide from the New England Journal of Medicine tell that familiar story of discovery, perseverance, and interactions um, uh, and kind of interventions for improved health. And there's comfort in these stories from the vantage point of the present in the kind of linear progress trajectory that they reinforce. But COVID suspends this kind of humanist narrative, thrusting medicine into uncertain terrain and the world into a period of stasis. While uncertainty has long been central to medicine, COVID lays bare this tension in medicine's narrative, with certainty being central to our trust in the profession, despite it being imbued with uncertainty. Governments have largely placed their trust in medical officers to direct responses to the, pan to the pandemic, but when medical officers have made mistakes or changed guidelines around things like mask wearing following the release of new information, we've seen frustration with this vacillation experienced as a kind of betrayal in our trust in medicine to secure our futures. So COVID has posed a kind of disruption to medicine's story. Like HIV in the 80s and 90s, COVID has displaced medicine's discovery and conquest story with a more complex tale that includes fear of the unknown. So um, I asked with colleagues, how are healthcare professionals playing their roles and learning to kind of work within medicine's new narrative? And for answers, we looked at the narratives of COVID-19 frontline responders collected for an international webinar held in July. Uh, so the first story is that of Hassan, a staff specialist in internal medicine at a Gold Coast hospital. So he was among the, the team that treated some of the first patients in Australia, actors Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson. Hassan describes the actors as whistleblowers, awakening Australia and his hospital from their paralytic fear of COVID and prompting a call to action. He says, consequently, our infectious diseases team established COVID wards. Hospital governance came up with a multi-tier action plan. Appropriate working groups were appointed in advance. The fear of the unknown deterred some workers, but Hassan saw COVID as quote, a once in a lifetime event. So he volunteered to be a leader of the COVID response team and began directly treating COVID-19 positive patients at the end of March. Um, because the hospital was well equipped with the necessary personal protective equipment, Hassan said he never felt any risk, but this feeling was not shared by others in the community. <clears throat> As the first wave progressed, reports of health professionals in the community in Australia and abroad being targets of scorn and fear um, had become commonplace in the media. So Hassan began to share the sense of vulnerability and, and fear projected by neighbors. None of his patients died, but a close friend in the, co in the UK contracted the disease and died. Subsequently, the fear of getting COVID and transmitting the infection to others became stronger. And this niggling sense of helplessness started to seep in. He said, the stress of your patient deteriorating in front of your eyes and you are unable to do anything is the worst fear for a doctor. And the sense of powerlessness was undergirded by widespread uncertainty. He said, there was no treatment. We knew too little about COVID at that stage. And he goes on to say, in hospital, a strict hygiene protocol was maintained daily. But despite all this, I was seen by others in my community as a potential threat of COVID. I was asked to stay in hospital indefinitely. My family was seen by neighbors as a possible source of infection too. So from Hassan, we gain insight into medicine's changed emotional climate. And from a narrative lens, we hear a genesis story, the start of the conflict between forces with patients, healthcare professionals, and the community confronted by COVID's wrath. 
We hear his excitement at rising to the challenge, along with his sorrow for the loss of a close friend. And we bear witness to the rising sense of fear and helplessness that goes with confronting a novel disease. We get a glimmer of the uncertainty swimming below medicine's shining surface. The plot twist in the call to action of this early chapter in this story is that the victors, vectors, um, and victims are all one. Health professionals at risk of infection, nonetheless acting to treat and protect the public from COVID. And the villain takes many shapes. It's found in the disease, the community, and possibly even in oneself as a potential source of infection. In the next chapter, we learn what it means to play the part of the duty-bound health professional acting and enduring to help those struggling. New Zealand nurse May's story starts in late February. New Zealand has its first COVID-19 patient. May says, I heard on the news that the hospital was treating the first COVID patient. I had assumed the patient would be treated in another ward, so I was surprised when the patient was in our ward. Moreover, when I learned that I would be the nurse taking care of him that shift. And her initial reaction, um, her inclination was to run. She said there was a lot of fear and anxiety every time we heard the world and local news. I felt like quitting. I had just joined the hospital for a three month contract, but I said to myself, I was called to be a nurse to serve the sick, regardless of the sickness and the situation. So I stood firm and I'm doing my best to serve my patients and protect myself and my family at home too. And protecting her family at home meant weeks without physical contact with her spouse or children. She says, practicing social distancing at home was hard, setting guidelines, having separate utensils, no other stuff in the toilet or shower room. Each person had their own basket for toiletries for two months, not sleeping in the same room with my spouse and not being able to kiss and hug my kids. It was also the time that my children were at home doing distance learning with my spouse. So sorrow and longing ting tinged with inert compassion are evident in how May describes her life while working on the COVID ward. May's sense of loneliness was only interrupted by her feelings of camaraderie with the others working on the COVID ward. She says on the ward, uh, our ward was our bubble during COVID. Healthcare professionals were alone together as the hospital responded by isolating the COVID ward, including restrooms, equipment, cleaners, kitchens from all other wards in the hospital. All doors were locked. No other ward had access to ours. A buddy system where each nurse worked with one other nurse during the course of a shift meant she didn't feel alone when caring for patients on the COVID ward. Um, the other nurse was there to kind of share in the caring for the patient, assist in maintaining infectious disease control measures and break up the oppressiveness of isolation. So May's story is one of reckoning. It's a story of self reconstruction and renewal where the hero is forced by necessity to recognize first what they truly value and desire and second, and, and these are Frank's words, second, the fullest extent of their capacity to act in order to achieve what is valued and desired. So from May, we learn what it means to live well, to embody a sense of duty, to endure isolation and manage emotionally and relationally. <clears throat> May's story offers insight into the sense of loss that is magnified for frontline health workers lost certainty about the future, lost contact with family, lost taken for granted sense of infection security. The sorrow that imbues her tale is interrupted only briefly by her feelings of belonging and solidarity with colleagues whose shared sense of camaraderie offers temporary respite. The final chapter of our COVID narrative culminates in a path forward, not just for health professionals working on the front line, but for the broader public as well. Nurse practitioner Deborah was called on in mid-March to set up New Zealand's National Close Contact Service. And she tells of the kind of emotional contagion of COVID spread also by phone. She says, I was responsible for confirming that people had COVID-19 calling close contacts and informing people that self-isolation was required for 14 days. I also fielded phone calls from nurses and people in the community who were unwell. As more and more callers were recruited to the NCCS, our small group of five nurses became more responsible for pastoral care. There were tears, feelings of fear of the unknown, and as the COVID-19 outbreak continued, anxiety increased. However, our leadership was calm and clear. We had a capacity style. We've got this if we do this. In short, Deborah's narrative is a call to reinvest our trust in medicine. The virus has one goal, to infect the host. Our job is to spread 
sorry, to stop that from happening. And the only way to do that is to listen to the science and public health advice, self-isolate. So Deborah's chapter offers an ending to our tale, a path out of the turmoil, a decision on how to respond as health professionals and as humans. Humans, regardless of a vaccine, her story tells us that the challenges of COVID-19 can be endured through strong leadership, quarantine, and contact tracing. But rather than a traditional resolution as might be found in a happily ever after tale, Deborah's story offers a road for us to walk down. As Bruner explains, some stories are about finding meaning in the road rather than the inn to which it leads. Once we know what road we're walking down, we can then discover or rediscover who we are and what we are to do. So I'll finish uh, with just a quick invitation to consider some implications from these two threads. So first, within healthcare, we've seen fear of contagion underpin the ostracization and alienation of healthcare professionals from neighbors and the wider community. But we see solidarity between healthcare professionals working together on the front line grow. So with COVID-19, we've seen trust in medicine on a mass scale simultaneously challenged and reaffirmed with health professionals positioned in roles of victors, vectors, and humans. Second, we're seeing COVID challenge Beck's famous assertion that um, trust is waning in science's capacity to solve the world's greatest challenges in late modernity. And said we're seeing polarity with some clinging to a faith in science to bring us back to normal through a vaccine and others dwelling on uncertainty around things like mask wearing. And finally, uh, attention to Frank's work on narratives and the concept of mass emotional events pushes us perhaps to kind of recognize these emotional events as collective, layered, and cyclical. Rather than one emotion or ambivalence, we're seeing fear and anxiety give way to complacency or resolution before the story begins again with a new wave or a new crisis. So insight into illness narratives may be useful here. Um, to quote Frank, comfort and danger, joy and plight may actually require each other. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And now we'll hand on very directly to, to Sam. Thanks everyone. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay. Is everyone able to see that? Yeah, cool. All right, I'll start. Uh, I'm Sam Hahn, Senior Lecturer of Anthropology and Sociology and the Deputy Director of the Career Research Center at UWA. Um, and the title of my talk is Interfacing the Tragic, the Meta Picture of Banal Suffering in Unsettled Times. Um, a lot of my thinking regarding death and tragedy comes from my recent book, um, which unfortunately came out right before the onset of the global pandemic, but it's all right because uh, I'll be presenting a brief snippet of the chapter that links, uh, that serves as the link to my next book, which is on tragedy. So death and tragedy, if 2020 hasn't affected you, it certainly has affected me. Um, so what follows is a very, very small kind of excerpt. Um, I can... Okay. Um, in the 1960s, George Steiner argued that the very achievements of modernity have made tragedy implausible. A tragedy is dead because it died of optimism, faith in reason, confidence, and progress. Put differently, the decline of tragedy was, quote, concomitant with the democratization of Western ideals, with the eclipse of imperative destiny and the power relations between mortals and the supernatural between, man, uh, between men and women and the state. And that's quoting Steiner. The death of tragedy, as Stephanie Alice Baker notes, is something like the literary version of Max Weber's influential analysis of modernity at disenchantment. Tragedy simply could not exist in a post-enlightenment age of reason. The worlds of Greek tragedy are full of myth, ritual, moral luck, and a conception of fate. The secularity of scientific and technological modernity is at odds with the fatalism of Greek tragedy. Uh, but like the secularization thesis, uh, the much maligned and now unfashionable conflation of modernity and secularity, the death of tragedy perspective was at best limited and at worst wrong. How could tragedy have been el eliminated when there is still so much suffering around the world? Um, hence it abounds, at least discursively and pop culturally, uh, with much of it occurring through media, 
Um, media transmits uh, the tragic in both imagistic and textual form to the masses. For some, like Luke Boltansky, who gave us that famous term, distant suffering, media has a negative effect on the representation of suffering. It distances and thus distorts. Media do not arouse emotions that sustain some legitimate response to the suffering. It merely turns the suffering of others into a spectacle. Uh, with the onslaught of tragic images on television and social media, we become, quote, immune to shock images, he argues. I, I want to explore how this immunity, which he calls the politics of pity, uh, takes place. Uh, so uh, to do so, I want to focus my discussion here on two images from 2017. Um, the um, the first circulated during uh, the height of the Syrian civil war. Um, and the resultant fleeing of refugees. Uh, the second during the height of protests associated with the movement for black lives in 2017 as well. Uh, I propose to do this from a perspective called iconology, uh, which the art historian W.J.T. Mitchell describes as the study of images across media. Um, Mitchell's approach has a particular uh, purchase in the digital era. Images as a result of digitization no longer adhere as closely to the referent. Digitization has made it far easier and convenient to edit copy, circulate, and disseminate images. Uh, with that, images no longer bear a close relationship to that which they originally represented, but rather become subject to repurposing. Uh, the emergent expressive culture of memes and gifs are but one example. Uh, this amounts to a new being in the world of photography. As Mitchell writes, rapid virulent circulation of digitized images gives images a kind of uncontrollable vitality. An, an ability to migrate across borders to escape containment and quarantine. This was written before those words became sort of at the tip of our tongues, uh, to break out of whatever boundaries have been established for their control. It extends beyond the simple content of the image and goes to the narratives, frameworks, and justifications surrounding it. Mitchell's theory of the image can thus be uh, understood as a double relationality. It is both the relation or mode of contact, as he says, between people. So between the creator and the beholder, between the sender and the receiver, and oftentimes today, uh, they're sort of collapse, right? We have this unfortunate term, uh, the prosumer, uh, and between objects as well, the picture and the thing that it represents. Thus, it is emotional or cognitive and representational, to use the words of Mitchell. The image can thus be described as a living thing, a product of the second nature of culture created by human imagination. And thus Mitchell calls this sort of approach uh, and, uh, or the object of iconology a meta picture to kind of capture the idea that you're looking at what's in the image, but also how it circulates and how it's contextualized and recontextualized. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to give a word of warning. Uh, there are images of folks who passed away and also a rather disturbing content. So um, I fully understand if you want to um, look away. Um, Sam, just yes. quickly, we're not seeing the slides properly. We're just seeing your PowerPoint uh, window. Oh, okay. I don't know how to share that. Okay, so you're just seeing my window? Yeah, there's a sort of program window. Okay. It's not in Strange. presentation mode. Yeah. Ah, okay, let me change that. Sorry about that, folks. Didn't want to interrupt your flow. For this oh, all good. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, hold on. I don't know how to. I have to go to setup slideshow. Okay, and let's see if this works now. Just give me a second. Hmm. It says it's not working. Hold on. Sorry, everyone. We actually met up yesterday to make sure this would work. Sam, you're back. We you, okay. You've got it now. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, 
So, um, an, icon an iconological perspective uh, pays dividends for the study of an image like that of Alan Kurdi. Uh, the photograph spread on social media, catalyzed by Human Rights Watch's initial posting. It later spread from social media onto traditional media. Uh, the photograph appeared in hundreds of international newspapers, appearing on the front page of over 40 of them, uh, to my knowledge. When approaching the image icono iconologically, uh, we can analytically separate the effects into the two planes of, rela of relationality as earlier mentioned. There's, of course, the social or communicative layer, and there is the representational or pictorial layer. Uh, within the social layer, there is the photo's moral message. Uh, perhaps it was the failure of the West, the evil of the Syrian government, the moral bankruptcy of Daesh, and so on. But what seemed to be echoed by the majority of commentators had to do with the photographs, quote, disturbing content of a child dressed to travel, lying face down on the beach, almost as if asleep. It reportedly, and I'm quoting, struck an emotional chord with viewers and highlighted the horror of the migrant crisis in Europe, as one photo editor put it. Uh, the Guardian similarly stated, quote, it woke the West to the urgency of the Syrian refugee crisis, end quote. The Guardian even credits the image for changing laws in Canada, allowing for refugees to qualify for asylum more easily. Uh, the ghastly find captured in the photograph uh, broke one of the social taboos in place for the press uh, for decades, according to the vice president of Getty Images, of running a picture of a dead child, calling it what you never published. But according to Peter Bucher of Human Rights Watch, who was the first one to distribute the photograph, uh, he suggests that audiences resonated with this image because uh, the first reaction is, quote, this could have been my child. Indeed, pointing out that Alan looks a lot like a European child, the identification with European and Western parents as uh, with uh, European and Western parents was aided by Alain's ethnicity. French newspaper Le Monde's photo editor went so far as to say, until you've shown this photograph, you haven't really shown the reality of this crisis. As the discourse among photo editors from major publications and human rights officials indicates, the moral crisis that is triggered by this photograph does not concern an individual figure or flaw, as in the case of classical tragedy, and most certainly not Alain himself. The emotional response, while not based on direct identification, is grounded in the thought that the circumstances surrounding this child could have also affected the viewer's child. Um, uh, but while in theory this is true, it hardly approaches reality. Uh, the structural reality of those who brave the Mediterranean to reach Europe hardly share any sort of condition similar to those in the West, at least those who would consider themselves to be in the audience of the Guardian, Le Mans, or Time. Uh, in spite of this, there seems to still be an assumption that the quote, fate of the world capable of producing the reality contained in the image of Alan is shared by those who spectate. It must uh, be something about these images that carry forth at the same time a shared vulnerability, something that John mentioned earlier, in spite of its distance while also covering over its factual reality. There must be something about the image that allows this contradiction to exist without much discomfort. And I want to suggest that this is due in part to the second aspect of the double relationality of the image, which has to do with the representational bond between the object and the captured image. Um, in effect, what the image does is to uh, present a unitary reality encompassing the spectator and the spectated, but one without much detail. Uh, one commentator, in fact, suggested that the image of Curdy compares to uh, Nick Ut's famous image of a young Vietnamese girl running naked from a napalm attack, as well as the image of Michael Brown's body uh, lying face down in the street for hours, which fueled the uprisings against police violence in Ferguson, Missouri, um, and ignited the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what this comment does uh, by presenting an equivalence between the Vietnam War and American police brutality uh, and also uh, uh, the Syrian refugee crisis is to uh, use the words of Roland Barthes, flatten death. One could venture to say that this has to do with the rapid circulation of the image uh, with the ethos of digital culture consisting of the imperative to share and growing significance of reposting and retweeting uh, on social media. The image stretches its relationship to the death portrayed in effect it becomes what Mitchell calls a meta picture, uh, which does not elevate the particular suffering, but rather banalizes it in the sense of making it every day, which is not to say that it's meaningless. Um, the idea of meaningless death will most certainly offend the sensibilities of those who consider themselves to be humane. Uh, but how we are viewing death today is most certainly what Barth dubs asymbolic. It is flat, as I mentioned. It is a death without the purpose of preserving life. It is, to risk a philosophical double negative, a nihilist death, 
this is not necessarily due to the um, quantitative overload of images of death around us today. It is not because the image is obscuring the real hidden truth of human fatality. One could not possibly think so when we see such vivid renderings of death every day. Take, for example, uh, the numerous deaths of young black men and women caught on mobile video and circulated widely on social media in the last five years. Uh, before the murder of George Floyd, there was the murder of Philando Castile, a school cafeteria worker from St. Paul, Minnesota, by an officer who had pulled him over for a malfunctioning taillight. Uh, and it was unique because his partner, who he was with in the car, as well as his daughter, uh, his partner had turned on a, a Facebook feature called Facebook Live and streamed it. Um, because she had, quote, feared for her own life. Castile, when pulled over, had informed the officer that he had a legal firearm with him and was licensed to carry it. When he reached for the, his uh, driver's license and registration, uh, the officer uh, then shot Castile. Uh, uh, Castile's partner says, because I know that people are not protected against the police, I wanted to make sure if I died in front of my daughter that people would know the truth. That's what she's quoted as saying. The video first posted on Facebook, then uh, went viral. Um, what's, what's notable is the commentary around this, and uh, I won't get into this, but Trevor Noah of The Daily Show actually says something quite astute. He says that uh, Castile and uh, his partner uh, had the presence of mind to add sir uh, when speaking to the officer, even after he had shot four bullets into Castile, a depressing realization that even under duress, Black people in America, quote, never forget their training. Um, so I'll, I'll just wrap up here. Um, Alain Badu claims that modernity is an era dominated by, quote, non-tragic nihilism. Quote, calmly setting finitude at a distance, Badu writes, we have resigned ourselves to a generalized slow death. What we avoid and find unacceptable is a tragic or unexpected death uh, and a catastrophic death, uh, as that would entail the loss of rational control and the seeding of larger superhuman forces. Um, that just wouldn't uh, make sense uh, to our modern sensibility. Death out in the open is one that does not fit with the law of modern death, he writes. But the deaths that I just discussed briefly here are deaths out in the open, ones that should not fit into the law of modern death, uh, at least by the logic presented by Baidu, by Baidu. Certainly they should not be acceptable since they are sudden and too soon. Yet they are apparently. We notice them, but then quickly move on. The question that Baidu's non-tragic nihilism uh, occasions is one of who is included in, mod in modernity's project of slow and untragic death. With the mediatization of death, we're seeing more clearly, as Badu says, um, not only do we die, but that also death happens to you. That is depending on who you are. Just look at um, who uh, among the quarter million deaths in America from coronavirus have died. Uh, how are they viewed? Do they count as tragic? We count them um, as the number on the right of that particular image shows, uh, but do they remain as statistical personages or do we ever uh, um, uh, raise them as grievable or mournable lives as Judith Butler says? Thanks. Okay, just give me one second. Um, start my slideshow. Hang on. It's never goes as smoothly as you think. Um, Okay, I think that's right. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll keep an eye on the time, but tell me if I'm <clears throat> rapidly approaching the end and not seeming to stop. Um, I probably have too much here, so I'll, I'll also try and cut on the fly a little bit. Um, so as you can see on the screen there with my, my title, um, I'm talking here about um, the idea of conjuncture in, in crisis, and I'll get to that in the second half of the paper. But first to talk a little bit about crisis. Um, for at least a decade, if not three, Western social formations have lived in what people have spontaneously called crisis times. 
The COVID-19 pandemic arrived as an acute moment in this chronic crisis period. In the early part of this year, and still today in parts of the US, I dare say, people waited for an official recognition of the event as one of crisis. A moment of crisis, whatever else it is, generally marks a suspension of business as usual. For many critics of the status quo, such a suspension is welcome in the sense that it seems to offer an opening to something new. At first blush, these can be intoxicating moments when all sorts of new imaginaries flood the scene. So just off the top of my head, I remember hopes earlier this year for climate change, for new ways of working, uh, for new recognition of care and essential work, for solidarity, for mutual aid, for marginalized communities. Um, for sure, some of these have come to fruition in, in remarkable ways. However, the glimmer of new horizons seems dimmed now. Some things will be carried forward, but still the longing now simply seems to be for a vaccine and for the whole period to be over. Thus, the concatenation of crises has hardly ushered in a radical shift in social power. I'm not sure how much we can say has truly changed in the capitalist social formations in our various nation states this year. If this is a rather gloomy and jaded opening sketch, I want to simply invoke how the fortunes of crisis times shift materially and effectively across various durations, be they week by week in panicked pandemic times, or say across the decade since the global financial crisis of 2007-8. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in this short paper, I'll focus on the question, this question of temporality and what I'm calling rather traditionally um, historical consciousness. Sorry. <clears throat> so I've roughly divided my paper into two halves um, to discuss first um, crisis as a category of our social world. That is not only as a diagnostic category for analysis, but also as an instrumental figure for those who administer social and political life. Second, I'll turn to conjunctural analysis as a fruitful method derived from cultural and social theory that can help us better constitute and understand the full range of influences at play in crisis times. These are large topics about which enough books have been written to fill a community library. My modest offer here is to put them in dialogue while thinking about the topic of our online conference and the panel. As it's so easy to do, I initially gave myself too broad a remit for the 15 minutes. So I'd hope to say more about imaginaries in this context and legitimacy, but I will briefly touch on them. So first to crisis. It's well known that our English term comes from the Greek crisis, that is with a K, where it meant decision or judgment. Joseph Fogel notes three roots of the term, um, judicial, medical, and military. First, a connection with the ancient judicial process, that is passing a sentence. Second, in medicine, the transitional phase evolving toward recovery or death. Third, a military context, the phase of war set on the threshold of victory or defeat. Right through to the present, we see the semantic overlap with other common terms like the critic, i.e. one who judges, or a medical condition said to be critical, where there's an uncertainty about the outcome and various adjudications will be made on the best course of action. It hardly needs to be pointed out too that it has important overlaps with critique and criticism as modes of engagement with social life. We see already the two sides of crisis that we still carry, namely an unfolding process on the one side and on the other an intellectual, intellectual aspect concerned with judgment if intellectuals and actors of various stripes are motivated to engage with the crisis, it's because a crisis seems loaded with the charge of being a decisive moment. The crisis highlights a transitional phase and one that is lived in the future perfect tense. That means a phase with an unclear future, but lived with a sense that something will have been decided in this moment. Increasingly, the realm of these crises have moved from localized systems, so from the legal or the political, to generalized crises, ramifying into all areas of life. 
particularly as it moves into general circulation, the crisis offers crisis watches, a set of signs to be interpreted and symptoms to be diagnosed, as it was always in medicine. As Andrew Gilbert has put it in his recent book on crisis in 20th century thought, crisis operates as a conceptual mode for observing and describing our world. Gilbert dubs this mode in the lineage of prominent thinkers in it, the crisis paradigm. Increasingly, the crisis paradigm grows out of a perception of instability. Living in crisis foreshortens our sense of historical time and the present. I want to make two remarks on this, one experiential and the other um, about how some actors can wield this dimension of crisis. First, I've been reminded this year of a text Lauren Berlant wrote shortly after Trump was elected in 2016. In it, she commented on the phenomenon of the TLDR, that is, the too long didn't read. At one level, it is hard to absorb, read, and to take things in while in crisis. So the genre of the TLDR, which is a short form precy of a much longer argument, this genre indicates a different form of reading. Berlant observes that um, the effective and political pressure of crisis disrupts both listening and reading. It forces skimming, flailing, jumping to conclusions and trailing off into ellipsis, along with the collapse of the difference between obsession and distraction. Crisis forces a scanning. It can be tough to tell what to attend to in a crisis. It instills a chron chronically heightened state of awareness in which everything is, well, critical. That is something we're all well and truly aware of right now, even as professional readers and writers, let alone say as students trying to develop skills in this context. So in some ways, the challenge of responding as researchers is to turn our minds to something that feels present and real and that nevertheless operates within a longer time scale than the drip feed of our news about an unfolding crisis. So the second aspect of this, I want to say, is, is again this problem of historical consciousness and the way that can be taken up by certain powerful actors. This returns to the perception of instability. Where does this insecurity come from? We could say a generalized sense of manifest insecurities and in impersonal processes. Even before COVID-19, if you can cast your mind that far back, we already lived among a persistent awareness of crisis. The future was highly certain. At some level, the heightened sense of uncertainty is based in real conditions, but there is also a performance of insecurity, as many sociologists have noted, as John touched on in his paper. This is a large theme. So on one side, we have certain mechanisms, procedures, or processes that have slipped out of our control and have come to represent events signaling reduced responsibility. On the other side, strategic use of the notion of crisis occurs when the capacity for decision and action is replaced by a kind of decision and action directed by the event itself. So I wanna say that the equivalent of the too long didn't read among governing elites is the cry that we must act immediately. There is no time, they announce, for reflection upon fundamental causes. Rather than the suspension of the status quo, this move can enforce it via the reflex to act at any cost. In this way, the designation of crisis can license a technocratic expert activity that purports to be outside political contestation. Crisis is thus, contra the progressive hope that it may bring communities together, wielded as a demobilizing force or a demo demotivating one. The crisis is complex, the message appears to be, so only experts acting within the guides of present common sense can have solutions. There are no alternatives to action. The politician declaring a state of emergency can become an organ of power in contemporary crisis discourses. These are those who, by boldly declaring a crisis, desire sacrifice and blood as the recourse to Churchill always underlines. These figures claim to speak for others and to call on others. While there's the one who acts decisively, for the rest of us, crisis can also entirely dispose of courses of action. It can instill passivity. Crisis talk can mean, I can't do anything about this. If this sounds like fate, then a dramatic mode is plotting the story. And I thought about this with Rebecca's um, talk too. Crisis relates to catharsis. That is to say, a passage through difficulty leading to better times. 
This understanding pops up in, when we speak of personal crises or existential crises or adolescent crises. This form of progression seems deeply attractive to Western culture. Essentially, the modern individual is from the outset a kind of crisis creature that moves through critical situations and dysfunctional phases and becomes more or less mature and responsible. This pattern is legible everywhere, from developmental psychology to Greek tragedies and Hollywood narratives. It's also there in the redemptive narratives of what a crisis will become. And with this invocation of the duration of crisis, let me shift rather abruptly to the question of time, history, and analysis in a different mode. So I want to return or turn to a classic text in cultural theory, indeed practically one that's practically foundational for cultural studies, which concerned itself with a crisis in the UK around Thatcher's time, namely policing the crisis. This touchstone work was a transdisciplinary collective effort to understand, as the subtitle put it, mugging the state and law and order in 1970s Britain. In this and other works, we find the conjunctural analysis pioneered in British cultural studies and associated most prominently with Stuart Hall and figures in the Birmingham School. Although thinking through the conjuncture is common in Marxism that orbits Lenin, Gramsci and Althusser, it gradually developed into a distinctive cultural studies analytic method, albeit one only belatedly recognized as such. Only very recently has conjunctural analysis become systematized as something like a methodology. This has been done by figures such as Lawrence Grossberg and John Clark and was accelerated by appraisals of the late Stuart Hall's legacy, including his influential synthesis of Althusser and Gramsci. Materially, it is worth remembering that conjunctural analysis was forged in the 1970s, a period that Klaus Offer had already indicated in 1972 as demonstrating, quote, the crisis of crisis management. These experiments in theory and criticism were engagements with this conjuncture in which crises were all pervasive. The return of conjunctural analysis today then is hardly a surprise. The decade after the 2007-2008 financial crisis helped motivate a diagram of the manifold effects emergent during crisis periods. So conjuncture comes from Latin conjugare, meaning to bind or join. And this carries over into those uses of conjuncture that indicate a quote, combination of many circumstances or causes, which is the definition given by Samuel Johnson in his dictionary of 1755. So we can mini minimally characterize con approach to multi-causal explanation. The policing the crisis authors explained that the conjuncture designates a specific moment in the life of a social formation that refers and refers to a period when the antagonisms and contradictions which are always at work in society begin to fuse into a ruptural unity. The Policing the Crisis Collective a, arrived at their diagnosis only by continuing to expand their canvas. So, hence demonstrating that this analysis is not a goal, but, a, but an analytic or a process. They carried on their work because they saw that the conjunction may be a time of multiple intersecting crises of various different sorts. It's a point of condensation, as Althusser would put it, in which various contradictions will come together, reinforce, inflect, displace and intensify each other. So axiomatically then, any situation will have multiple determinations. The aim is to examine conditions in their complexity. Conjunctural causation sees events caused by concatenations of multiple intersecting forces and historically unique and non-repeatable combinations. The challenge registered by theorists of the conjuncture is to stress the complex, uneven and overdetermined character of social reality without resorting either to a surface phenomena slash deep structures dualism or to the empiricism of simply registering singular practices. So what does this mean? Historical conditions are overdetermined, hence they are multiple and go beyond any subject's will, be that Trump, Jermaine Greer, or your next door neighbor. The policing the crisis example shows that such an analysis must deploy a periodization, and here we come back to time, 
based on a distinction between moments of relative stability and those of intensifying struggles and unrest, which may result in a more general social crisis. So a conjuncture has no fixed duration, but will last as long as a crisis and its formational contradictions remain unresolved. In such a case, further crises are likely to proliferate and echo around different domains of, social, of the social formation. So the Policing the Crisis book was completed well before the crisis itself could be said to be resolved, which also meant it represents an intervention into a live issue, even as it could not offer definitive conclusions. Conjunctural analysis recognizes that such an approach will be an incomplete project and that this project is irreducibly collaborative, a conversation across many fields and discourses, as well as knowledges and institutions. Um, I know time is rapidly running out, so let me just quickly give you a sense of what such an articulated inquiry can look like today. Um, so this is from a recent work by uh, Lawrence Grossberg on the present conjuncture as seen from the US. I've split it into two halves because I realized it would have been totally unreadable um, uh, as one long block, it's, but it's probably bad enough as it is. In any case, I just wanted to show this sort of level of um, into interweaving causation and, and everything that he's gone into in detail in his work, thinking about the current conjuncture, as I said, seen from the US. One of the points I really want to underline though, which I'll assert with Grossberg rather than outline it in detail, given I'm running out of time, is that conjunctural analysis demands two maps of the situation, a material structural map and an effective map. These levels are articulated yet relatively autonomous. The analysis asks and explains how these lived realities are organized, made, remade, and reorganized. At various points in my talk, I've tried to give a flavor of this by mentioning how effective life Ben, we've lost you. We're in a crisis moment, I fear. Um, see if we'll, we'll wait one moment, just see if you can come back. You were, your image was frozen for a while, uh, and then it, uh, just melted away, um, or collapsed. So you've embodied the, uh, the theme of the talk beautifully, uh, if perhaps unintentionally. Uh, Ben is probably uh, working very hard to come back. Yes, I can see somewhere. There he is. Hi, Ben. Okay. You're back on. Go. Um, so, yeah. Um, in sum, I hardly want to put a ban on the use of crisis as a category for analysis. Rather, I want to introduce a pause each time we feel inclined to use it. And each time we see it used by others to consider precisely what is being moved by the term one that falls all too easily from our lips. I also want to argue that our analyses of such conjunctures need to operate with uh, multi-causal explanations. This is what conjunctural analysis as an investigative mode can offer, even at the price of an ever expanding range of investigations. If that drives us to a certain overdrive of boundary crossing to draw upon the range of the humanities and social science disciplines relevant to the theme of inquiry, this at least seems preferable to monocausal crisis narratives that lose complexity at the price of brevity. There is, of course, the genuine possibility of driving yourself mad with the range of conjunctural inquiry, but we're already living in maddening times, so why not take ourselves deeper into the asylum? Okay, thanks. Ben, thank you very much. So now look, we can um, hand over to any question? Does anyone have a question they like to raise? Um, there are various hands up, and I, oh no, I think they're just uh, saying uh, extremely well done. I think that's what <laughs> yeah. Uh, while um, you're all thinking about questions, uh, look, I have one for Sam, and I know he's going to go off to a, a, his own book launch pretty soon. So let me um, just. Uh, raise it. Uh, Sam, the, the, the sort of the, the images and icons that are now mobile, as it were, and are sort of meta, 
uh, that you talked about and the uh, the banality of the contemplation of suffering and death that you also highlighted i think uh, i'm just wondering how that works with those images that we see on television of people in COVID-19 wards laying flat on their face with or intubated or having that vapor therm uh, with um, nurses and doctors garbed in all that stuff as uh, Jody Doring says, uh, wandering about, sitting at home or wherever, knowing that um, unlike perhaps what's been happening in Syria or parts of Africa or whatever, this could be happening to each and every one of us as well. And I'm wondering if that changes the dynamics of the affective and broader response. Uh, thanks, John. That's a great question. I think um, one of the points that I sort of had to quickly move beyond because, uh, uh, because of time was sort of um, the question of number and the sort of the, you know, I sort of pointed to this idea of a statistical personage. Um, in one of my slides, I won't attempt to put it up again because I've had trouble with it. Um, you know, CNN for a long time, basically, no matter what the coverage is, has a, a graphic on the right side, which is a running count of how many deaths and infections there are. And my, my argument would be that um, we have a certain kind of uh, a, a certain kind of framing or a certain kind of mediation of those deaths. And those deaths are, are obviously not one which sort of highlights uh, the individual who suffered, but rather sort of adds that particular image of someone uh, with a breathing tube and a, and a whole host of kind of hospital staff tending to them. Um, yes, there is a kind of possibility, I would argue, that this could be you. But I think that that, that number, that, that counting is quite interesting to me. Um, it makes me think of the campaigns uh, growing up in New York, uh, in the public schools, uh, employing, uh, imploring kids not to become a quote unquote statistic. Um, and, I, and, and there's something to that, I think. We're, we're living in a sort of, um, I think at the same time, we're, we're inundated with images that sort of, uh, and you know, they're high death and sometimes they're alive, like the case of Philando Castile, um, who was murdered in his own car. Um, I, I, think that, I think that sort of adds, uh, I think it sort of does something to us. And I'm not suggesting that it's simply a politics of pity as Paul Tansky would argue, but I think there's something about the relationship that is sort of drawn. And, and the reason why I kind of talk about tragedies, tragedy here is because I think there's certain cases that we kind of recognize as tragedy and tragic. And there's certain cases that sort of add up to sort of this kind of abstract um, mass death count. Uh, any other questions from anyone? John, there seems to be one in the chat. Oh, right. Okay, there's a question there for Ben. So yeah. Ben, you have a look? Yeah. No, I mean, that's a very good question. And I, I was just thinking about it while Sam was answering as well. Um, I think um, it's... I was just thinking back to the start of this coronavirus crisis. And as I said, I felt like there was this hope that somehow these two crises would dovetail and in one swoop to mix metaphors, we would um, <laughs> somehow deal with the environmental crisis and the, the coronavirus at the same time, because people would stop traveling by car and everything. But I think that's sort of fallen apart a little bit now. Um, so I'm thinking a little bit about that just with your question in the way that these crises can become intractable in a way. And there's, there's always a, almost like a hope that a new crisis will come along to help the old crisis and sort of fold everything in together and deal with it in one big go. Um, so yeah, I, I, I certainly think the, um, the question of climate change needs to be, you know, top of the list and, and, and is, but I think the level of um, delay and denial and um, dragging it out that goes on with that question just, yeah, I mean, in a way, I think that 
sort of speaks to it needing a um, multi-level analysis to think about the various ways in which it's made to be such a drawn out question, unresolved and, and things like that, the various dimensions of it, if that makes sense. Anyone else? Oh, I just muted myself. Okay, can you hear me now? I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, let me uh, ask you a question which may be a little unfair because I haven't given you the chance to prepare for it. But um, your stories, particularly of May and Deborah, and um, if I'm right, that was happening at, uh, around uh, Gold Coast Hospital and with relatively few uh, viral infections and whatever. I'm wondering how into this, uh, this sort of um, s sequence of, of narratives and, and shifts in the narrative as carried by the, the, the three different figures that you focused on. If you were to introduce Jodie Doring, the, uh, the, the nurse from the emergency room nurse from South Dakota into this story, what might what might that do to the story? How might I, I mean? I, I think it would be productive. I'd like to just raise that with you. Uh, well, I think this is a very um, Australasian or Antipodean story. Um, I my sense, and and um, I'm open to being corrected, but my sense is that Jody's story is uniquely um, or maybe not uniquely, but especially North American, the kind of denial of COVID um, is something that's more pronounced within the US and of course, in particular places in the US more than others. Um, May and Deborah were uh, based in New Zealand where, uh, and um, Deborah's based in Wellington, May is based in, in Auckland during the times of these um, narratives. And the number of cases in New Zealand, of course, compared to elsewhere, um, it's, it's very minor <laughs> compared to the rest of the world. Um, but introducing uh, something like what Jody Doring is, is saying, uh, we still can kind of see some threads of relevance there where um, uh, we hear Deborah kind of trying to, retell the, the same old story. Uh, we need to trust in, in medicine. We, we need to, this, this kind of trust is our affective path beyond COVID. We can't, um, I guess, de devolve into um, a, a crisis mode that sees us relinquish all of our previous uh, forms of ontological security. So I, I think she's, her message is still relevant, even though she's speaking to a very different audience. I should mention that the, the international webinar um, featured speakers from uh, Australia, from New Zealand, as well as from South Asia, uh, where some of, the, um, some of the clinicians had been experiencing a lot more of that, um, a, a lot more of the, the high numbers that we've seen in the US, not to the extent that we've seen in Brazil and the US, uh, but uh, we didn't hear stories like what you've quoted from Jody Doring from any of the speakers from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. Um, so hopefully that answers your, your question, John. Oh, you might be unmuted. Am I muted? No, I was, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, uh, anyone else want to... Uh raise anything um doesn't yes hi hi how you guys um i'm still trying to absorb ben's presentation which um was great but it's uh it's going to take me a while um and i really like this idea this con this conjunction idea um but it also makes me think of the term conjunction you know does it mean the coming together of two things or does it mean the alignment of things without them necessarily being uh, being joined, um, and and I, and I bring that up because I think also about Rebecca's presentation and how she talks about rather than us being in a state of ambivalence where 
you know, all those emotions tend to flatten out. We're getting um, distinctive emotions occurring, but they're also kind of contradictory at the same time, like that light, rising level of trust, um, but also that rising level of exhaustion amongst the, um, the, the uh, medical staff. So I guess my question is um, trying to find somebody to connect across the two presentations a little bit uh, and, and, and wanting to interrogate this idea of uh, conjunction a, a little bit more and, and more, more, more precisely, like, you know, if you can be, Ben, um, like what you're, what you're getting at uh, with the, the, the concept. Um, it, it, sorry if this is rambling. I'm, I'm just downloading a, a thought. Um, off, back to you. Um, yeah, no, thanks. I know it, maybe the two parts of the paper didn't quite end up sitting so neatly together, but I guess I was trying. Um, and as you know, I've got like various other projects about emotions and, and affects and things. And really this I, interest in the conjunctural analysis comes out of thinking about things like disaffection and alienation and negative emotions as I have been. And um, so two things about that. One is about um, like being a bit dissatisfied with some of the shorter run answers to those things. Like it's not just about the finance, like even the financial crisis is, you know, feels long, medium term now. Um, but I think there's something longer term going on there that you need to be able to account for. So one of the, one of the questions is like, periodization like what period are we talking about and I think the conjunctural analysis approach is like deals quite specifically with that question of thinking about what historical events are you saying uh, uh, playing a role in the period and the, the theme and the objects that you're looking at so I, I find it useful as a method in that sense to try and um, be a bit more specific about that because um, there is a there is a, a risk of ending up talking about everything at the same time. And that is obviously starts to sound a little bit crazy and conspiratorial potentially as well. Um, so that's one answer. The second answer is just thinking today as I was looking over the paper, I guess, how this joins with other things I've done. And I guess I'm often interested in, say, either side of, of big events, so to speak. So like, looking at 1989 in, in Berlin, um, obviously there was the fall of the wall and that's really interesting and exciting, but I also think it's worth looking, if you can put it this way, at sort of the slopes on either side of that peak, that sort of emotional peak. So the sort of melancholy that comes after as well as this like sort of um, discontent that comes before and, and how those things build up to this point and then fall away again. And so I think this idea of looking across a longer period gives you a better way of, of sort of taking account of multiple things feeding into to those results in, in sort of um, social life, if that makes sense. Not sure I answered your question, but um, that's sort of where I'm seeing this fit in, in what I'm doing. Yeah. You're muted, John. I always do the wrong thing. Um, Rebecca, would you like to chime in on Roger's question as well? And now you're me. Yes, I would, I would just like to um, agree with what Ben was suggesting about the significance of temporality and I think the paucity of scholarship that attends to temporality and emotions um, and it, in, in regard to COVID and regard to, in regard to uh, pretty much most studies of emotions. Um, and I, I think he makes a, a really good point about um, the, the importance of, of thinking about that temporality. Um, we might see it to some extent um, in particular methods that um, look at using mixed approaches to analyzing emotions. Certainly, I think we have a lot to learn from historical approaches to uh, analyzing uh, emotions and their significance to structural enduring events. Mm -hmm. And look, I'll just pick up on uh, something that Roger said in passing um, when he was talking about ambivalence and used it in a particular way, which is uh, uh, certainly proper, but uh, I wanna just suggest that ambivalence itself is very ambivalent term. 
And Roger was using it to suggest that um, you get, a, a, in effect, a split and one deadened emotion sort of being dominant, as it were. Um, in my own talk, what I was talking about was um, a way of thinking about uh, how we can dwell in ambivalence, where the whole point of that argument is that the co-presence of the multiplicity of affects, so affective constellations, you could say, uh, is not split, not projected, not specialised in, uh, although we, we're seeing that happening all the time, but the resistance to that through the transformation of uh, norms of recognition that can support a capacity to dwell in ambivalence offers a, um, an antidote to that splitting and that particular form that ambivalence can take. So, and uh, as I mentioned in passing, uh, within psychoanalytic theory, Kleinian theory is particularly relevant in that respect. And as it happens, Kleinian theory is the theory that more than any other of the psychoanalytic theories foregrounds emotions and the complexity of emotions and the variability of them. Um, so Roger, thank you for, <laughs> for that. Uh, any other questions or th things that people would li like to raise? We're, we're running up to the time when Sam needs to go to his book launch and uh, we're all invited along, I know that. Uh, we don't have to even move very far to get there. You have to bring your own drinks, however. Um, I can't see anything else. Um, Sam, did you want to just um, say a few words and then uh, we'll we'll uh, say goodbye. Yeah, I was just typing into the chat that I needed to go, but um, yeah. So I really appreciate uh, I like all the perspectives that were shared just now. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for all the thank you to the audience for um, coming. Uh, it's a, pr a pretty good turnout. Yes, thank indeed. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I don't feel that there's any pressing further question. Um, we all have email addresses. If anyone wanted to contact us, we'd be no doubt uh, happy to uh, enter into a dialogue. And um, we have recorded this. So if you ever want to revisit it, uh, it will uh, probably be there somewhere in the, uh, in the virtual world that we all inhabit so much of the time. Uh, look, thanks uh, particularly to my co-presenters. It's been a great pleasure working with the three of you and we've done a great job, I think, cobbling this together in the way we have uh, and actually getting it online as well, of which we were uh, dubious at one point. Uh, and thanks everyone and uh, we'll, we'll finish up now. <laughs>